So, uh, then uh, we come to the most important part of today's uh, conference. And uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to, uh, and I would like to say, uh, Mr. Crowdworking and Mr. Crowdsourcing uh, to have him here uh, at this uh, conference. And uh, I wouldn't have expected uh, that, it's, uh, that I'm so happy to have him here because he is also having uh, studied information systems. And uh, this apparently was of very much use uh, today because without him, we wouldn't have uh, fixed this problem here. And uh, so I didn't expect uh, <laughs> that it would be so helpful in many ways to have you here. And uh, to give you a short introduction, so uh, Jan Marco Leimeister uh, did a diploma in uh, business administration at the University of Hohenheim, where he also did his uh, doctoral degree. Uh, thereafter, he moved to Munich uh, to the Technical University, where he did his habilitation. Um, and then in uh, 2008, he got his uh, first uh, professorship in information systems at the University of Kassel. And uh, there he became also the director of the Information Systems and Research Center for Information Systems Design. Um, and in 2014, he then became a full professor and also director of the Institute of Information uh, Management at the University of St. Gallen. Uh, he has uh, published in very many journals. Uh, he's also the editor of uh, many journals. Among others, he's the associate editor of the European Journal of Information Systems. He's a senior editor of the Journal of Information Technology. And uh, he's an editorial board member of the Journal of Management Information Systems. And uh, he was also a long time uh, abroad. So he went to uh, many US universities like Harvard University, uh, the University of California at Berkeley, Columbia University at the East Coast. And uh, most recently, he was uh, the number four or uh, received the place number four among 2,824 uh, business uh, researchers in Germany, uh, which is ranked by the Wirtschaftswoche. And today he will uh, speak about understanding a new type of digital labor, how the nature of work affects uh, satisfaction and uh, identification among crowd workers. And we are very much uh, looking forward to your presentation and uh, very much appreciate that you are here. So thank you very much. So thank you very much for this very kind introduction. And after listening to what you said, um, I can only fail now, right? Because expectation management and reality will not match. Um, so let's uh, be clear about that right from the beginning. And I'll do my best to make it as graceful as possible when I, when I fail but I'm sure I will fail. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be here. It's, um, it's an interesting discussion that I could already observe and watch. And um, a lot of the things that um, the talks addressed, um, I think are of vital importance for our European community. Because um, what we're seeing here around crowd work is a little, little, little glimpse on what the future of digital work could look like, right? This is not everything that we will see in digital work. It's one type. There will be many others. But to me, it's like digital work on steroids. So a lot of the things that we see in crowd work, structurally, will also happen in other types of work. So that's why uh, when, when uh, um, Paul said that um, the phenomenon doesn't have that magnitude, that might be true for crowd work but the underlying problems have a huge magnitude. And um, I myself am a good example of uh, what you would call atypical employment, right? Having multiple appointments at the same time, working for different companies, for different universities, for different setups for a certain period of time. Um, in my environment, that's not unusual. And it happens more and more when I look at the younger generation that becomes more and more the dominant pattern. And all the challenges that we have around our social security system to deal with that type of things. Not so much about crowd work, but everything else. So maybe that's just to contextualize, right? And um, I will be standing here because I don't see my slides, right? So every time I walk there, I watch there, it's not because I want to be rude or something and show you my back, it's just because I don't know what's on the slides, right? So um, forgive me for that. So let me contextualize a little bit about the background of the research that I do. So um, this is my team and um, most of the work that we do is joint work, right? So I will not take credit for everything uh, by no means. Very often it's their hard work and me just communicating it. That's also true to some degree um, for the study about today. The study of today is joint work with Ivo Blom and David Dovart, and it's coming out of one of the currently 23 projects we do at our 
um, Institute. Um, it's a project funded by the Hans Böckler Stiftung. For those of you who are not familiar with that, that's the foundation of the German unions, which means um, the, the research is funded by unions worrying about what their take on the future of digital work will look like. I find that very interesting, right? So they worry about what does, does that mean for social systems, social security and so forth. And um, it is part of a context of, of five projects where we deal with crowd or crowd type uh, of work settings. And um, since I didn't know what to expect today, I prepared a very classical paper-based talk. So the talk that I will give is basically about one paper and one study we've done. But I'm more than happy to share everything that is happening right now in the other projects because to me it makes only sense um, if we see the broader picture and how these things relate. If I was to present what we're currently doing, I would be speaking only about internal crowd work. So crowd work applied within organizations and across organizations. This paper here is about external crowd work. So this is the type of out in the wild, open call, internet based no employment contract whatsoever around. Right? So I would like to follow this agenda, um, which means I'll try to lay out my definitions and understanding of the crowd phenomenon, how it also relates maybe to the definition of work and employment and gainful employment, because that's very, very important to see um, how we can address regulatory issues or uh, things alike. Uh, would then um, give you a little bit of context about this particular theory background that we apply here, where we work with um, self-determination theory, which is a very popularly, widely used theory in work psychology. And to use that to better understand, is there a different type of perception of digital work among crowd workers? And if so, what drives it? And is it any structurally different to other types of digital work or employment? And I will, in a, in a couple of seconds, give you the punchline and you'll see um, that there might be some uh, special things around that. Um, exactly, when it comes to the method, um, that is up to your interest. Uh, we're doing a rather sophisticated um, mediated moderation um, analysis. Uh, I've learned a lot uh, working on that paper, especially with Ivo. He's a method guy coming from that field. I now feel comfortable that I can present that without major issues, but rest assured, the first time we ran into that, um, that was quite an effort for me, uh, because it's quite different to what we've been doing uh, before. And at the end, um, I will also give you some implications on, on different layers, right? So just me thinking aloud, what could that mean for either theory development in certain areas, but also when it comes to implication for practitioners, for crowd workers and organizations. So what I usually do is I structure my talk in three parts. First of all, I will tell you what I will tell you, then I tell you, and then I tell you what I told you. So this is what I will tell you. Um, I will show you that satisfaction with work, with crowd work, mediates the effects of several task characteristics. And it'll mediate the effect on, to us, the final focal variable, which is identification with crowd work. You might wonder why is identification with crowd work relevant? That is the key variable to make a sustainable work life, or a work perception um, measured like the um, colleagues in work psychology do, right? So satisfaction is rather temporarily shorter. So you can be satisfied with an episode or something. But if you're fully convinced of your work setting, then you will identify with it. So that's the long term uh, um, variable that we have in mind. We will also show that the effects um, that we see are stronger for crowd workers that are able to realize a greater financial compensation. What does that mean? Our data makes us believe that we see a plateau effect of salary. There are other theories that work with that um, as well, that you need a certain level of employment before other characteristics kick in. I mean, this is very much a Maslow type of logic that you see here. Or Herzberg two-factor theory would, would also say that. We will show that we have that, but on top of that is like a catalyst for making after that plateau level, the effects of um, ta task characteristics even stronger. What that would mean um, is that um, we, can, we, can, we can discuss later. 
And we will also see that from a psychological point of view, what you very often see in crowd work is um, a Tayloristic approach. You make tasks smaller, smaller, smaller. But there's an, a limit to that um, decomposition where the advantages of making tasks smaller and less knowledgeable in execution has a negative trade-offs if you push things too far when it comes to the satisfaction and the um, overall identification with that type of activity that you see within the crowd. So that is basically the punchline um, of the whole talk. And uh, let's see how we get there. Um, to me, the overarching term for crowd work is crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is the principle, right? It's not new. You probably heard about it multiple times. The, the most um, prominent source where it was uh, named for the first time goes back to Jeff Howe in the, in the Wired magazine in the mid-2000s. And uh, back then, and that's how the article started, he was describing something he observed in the Silicon Valley. That's it, right? Where you would see um, startups um, having e-commerce business models without any technologist in the team. And uh, against common wisdom, you would assume if you're a technology-based business, you would probably need someone knowledgeable about technology in your team. And he was seeing the contrary. And that was when he was starting to look into that. And he found out that uh, because of the scarcity of some tech talent in the, in the Bay Area, they were working project based in parallel in multiple settings. And that's basically where he described for the first time this crowdsourcing thing. And the key components he mentioned was the open call and it's the voluntary participation. So that's the principle, right? That has uh, got a lot of attention in the work environment, uh, especially if you go to the IT field. Um, where we have the concept of um, cloud computing as a way of delivering IT services. When you need it, you use it. When you don't need it, you switch it off. And that requires, of course, the same concept for work. Right? So basically, it's the cloud computing principle applied to human work. And uh, for the first time, large scale, um, we came across it in, in the IT field. Right? And where it wasn't so much about the startup scene, but ordinary jobs in data centers or in application development where the same concept uh, was, was pushed. And um, if you talk to IT executives, they would still love that concept, right? Because it would allow them to scale and adapt the workforce and workload um, exactly like they feel the market cycles. Why is crowdsourcing potentially interesting when it comes to solving problems? I mean, that very much relates to what Lars Hornhoff was uh, presenting. Um, it gives us a couple of advantages compared to the way how companies usually work on problems. Um, the best one is that you s usually as a company search within your area of expertise. That would be one of the peaks in those profiles. Uh, once you extend that search environment and you access people who might be in other contexts, they might be coming from those environments or those environments. They can add type of uh, solution information to your process or to your tasks that you otherwise wouldn't be able to um, get hold of. And that is true um, for um, innovative problem solving as well as for uh, any type of um, challenge um, that you would pose to people in work. And uh, this goes back to um, research that has been done in the open innovation field uh, in the um, the programming environment it would go on and on and on. Every time you need creative solutions, that's the potential you can bring to the table compared to any other organization. So this here would be our maximum if we are in this organization and this search environment and we could jump up to that level by having someone with that skill set, mindset, coming from the other organization to work with us. And this is very much similar to a lot of things we see in digital work, where collaboration patterns do not stick to boundaries of organizations, but rather emerge across it. So software development is very interesting. If you think like plat of platforms like GitHub, um, it's very easy to set up projects. No one cares which organization you work for, actually. Um, it's the setup where you are thinking like plug and play to get a project going, and this is um, an, an environment where that could help, right? Um, the other thing when we talk about um, the nicheness um, of the phenomenon, a couple of, um, of tasks of organization nowadays are mainly, mainly, mainly done using crowdsourcing principles, right? 
And if you look at the big brands, for instance, in the last 10 years, 85% of them have applied it at least once. More than 50% apply it regularly. Does it replace what they have been doing, for instance, in product development or in marketing campaigns? No, it doesn't. It's broadening their repertoire. So this means if you think like consumer brands like L'Oreal, for instance, they adopt those mechanisms for certain campaigns, for certain elements, and now they have a broader repertoire and more choices to, to choose how to play, to play their game. Right? The other thing is, what is it that the crowd can do? And um, if you take um, a depiction, a porter style uh, of an organization, you would see that in almost every function of an organization, you would uh, find at least one um, successful crowd-based um, service provider operating. Not doing exactly the same with the full fledge of every activity, but some of it, right? And uh, let's use some examples so that you can illustrate that, right? Um, we know that um, when it comes to um, R&D, um, ideation and, and open innovation has been around for quite a while. That's not, nothing surprising, I think. Um, that's um, also related to what Lars Hornhoff was presenting. That's, that's a well-known suspect. But let's look into other areas, right? So, for instance, in the area of services, um, you would find companies like CrowdGuru or Mila that would offer crowd-based after-sales services. Mila, for instance, is a Swisscom um, um, subsidy that offers neighborhood services, customers help customers. And it's a way to um, complement the existing service offers that Swisscom has. And um, it is basically a matchmaking platform where the crowd can help each other, right? And it's an economically very interesting uh, model. Uh, when you go to uh, marketing and sales, for instance, um, you would use um, service providers like Across that could uh, help you with any type of multi-language um, uh, material that you want to use. So basically uh, complementing or replacing um, translation services. Or also very interesting, you would have, um, I don't have it on the slides, but um, it's, it's um, uh, currently being um, bought by um, DHL, a company that does Uber for your trunk, which means it's, it's a crowd-based mechanism for intraday logistics. Right, so people think of um, uh, cosmopol uh, of metropolitan areas with a lot of traffic happening. Is there a way how we can make use of all those empty trunks being driven around? Is that a case we can use of? And of course we can, and that's that's um, also a similar mechanism. And uh, one of the most interesting areas where, to me, um, crowd work and crowd testing is changing the game is software testing, Be especially user-based software testing. Um, if you think of um, testing mobile apps or something like that, to me there is no other way how to do that reasonably than without crowd testing. Because the variety of devices that people have combined with operating systems, combined with software versionings, it's, it's not controllable. You would have millions of combinations. So standard testing mechanisms can control for maybe 30-40% 30, 30, of what you would need to test. With a crowd, you can almost cover everything. And uh, so the most dominant players, test TestBirds or also Brains from Switzerland, um, they are basically taking that market, right? So that's one of the cases where crowd-based uh, um, uh, um, um, business models are def definitely uh, winning the market against their um, traditional um, yeah, competitors. And you could go on, and your vote was an interesting case when it comes to innovation support during product development and so on. Now, but the talk is not about crowdsourcing, it's about crowd work, right? And now, I'm not an expert in uh, work law or in any type of law, I'm just a lay person uh, working every now and then with uh, some people from law, and that is basically my um, internal framework, how I try to communicate them, right? So, first of all, work is an effort for accomplishing a task. That's a general definition, that's the least uh, common denominator um, that uh, my colleagues um, came up with. So then we go to paid work, right? Which is goal-directed effort for creating income. Now we're getting closer to uh, gainful employment, right? Then a subset of that would be digital work, which means it's an effort to create digital goods that make substantial use of digital tools for creating income. Right? So that's the digital work part. And this one here, this one is growing. This one is growing quickly and in multiple ways. And crowd work being one in there. Right? Now, 
which means there is work that is not paid. Right? Customers sharing ideas on platforms, that's not paid. That's not part of our digital work definition. Right? So that's why you would see that we would have crowdsourcing, paid and unpaid. And once it's paid, we would call it crowd work. So that's just for me to be very clear and simple on what we look at. And this study will look at crowd work. So it will not look on customers sharing creative ideas on user communities or on Wikipedia or anything because it's not paid. And the structure behind that would be different. Is that relevant? Um, there's been a 2018 study from the world, uh, from the OECD, um, trying to measure the f uh, size of the phenomenon. They came up with 1.2 million in Europe, uh, in, in Germany. Uh, we're having 42 million, roughly speaking, um, as, as uh, employees or as, as uh, workforce. So we would speak of a rather small percentage. Interestingly, now coming from Switzerland, Switzerland has almost the same amount of crowd workers, but just one-tenth of the workforce. So there the magnitude of the effect seems to be much stronger. Um, my explanation is very simple. Multiple employments uh, are much more common in Switzerland, people doing multiple jobs at a time, than it is uh, in, in Germany. That's probably one of the easiest explanations for that. The other thing that we know from other studies is that crowd work usually, the full-time crowd worker is a myth. In the studies that we've done so far, that was below 5% of the crowd workers active, but it's a huge amount of people doing second, third or fourth jobs and especially for covering for seasonal differences or for life uh, um, stages, baby pauses or whatever, when those things go up and become more relevant in the proportion of income that people get. Yeah, and you see that there are differences between the UK and between Italy. And one of the things that um, we're currently looking at, looking at the OECD data is um, we have the assumption that there is a co correlation, um, if we take Switzerland out of the equation, that uh, the unemployment rate and the amount of crowd work is directly correlated. So the more unemployment there is, the more people work in the crowd because it's an access to work. And that is very straightforward. Which would mean that for our German environment, given our good economic development the last 10 years, we're all lucky. We're all lucky, right? So once that changes, um, there will be probably much more uh, demand for crowd work than we would have. We've seen that indication in the data from the US as well. Um, when 2008 uh, was very, very hard for people there, um, platforms like uh, um, Amazon Mechanical Turk had three times, four times the amount of people looking for jobs. Now what happens if the amount of work doesn't go up and just more people look for work, prices go down. Um, so those mechanisms are the dynamic um, that we haven't seen here because of our economic development. And uh, a lot of the studies that we've done uh, in, in the last couple of years, uh, for instance, never came up with data from Germany saying that we have um, abuse of market power or something like that, or work below um, a minimum wage type of things. No, that wasn't uh, something we could report on. Uh, but the big um, elephant in the room is during economic times where there is no pressure on the system. Right? So those data have to be seen very careful uh, and interpreted very carefully um, because we don't know the strength of um, economic downturns on, on those systems. Right? So the research gap that we try to look at, um, we look at crowd working platform as labor markets. Um, we look at it in this study like an organizational focus. Right? And uh, we have a selection bias in what, whatever we do because uh, the only access to data that we get is voluntary um, participation in uh, interviews and surveys, right? So this is a big, big constraint, nothing we can do about it, other than trying the best we can to compare and triangulate with other data sources and see whether the patterns we see are stable across studies and across, and across settings. The second thing that we look at is the motivation of crowd workers, where we see differences, and there's a lot of research on that recently coming out uh, in different areas, what intrinsic and extrinsic uh, motives uh, or motivations of crowd workers are in different settings. Uh, one of the big um, constraints of the studies that we've seen, and I think I have the literature screened, I have it screened quite well, is that um, there are so many different types of crowd work that whatever study you see is true for that type of crowd work. 
not for all different types of crowd work. So if, if you do a study on Amazon Mechanical Turk, what you would find there for motives uh, would be true for micro-tasking. And if you would not be able to um, transfer it um, to software testing, for instance, and vice versa, right? So there's this big um, constraint that the type of work is still so heterogeneous that we're still, even within crowd work, comparing apples to oranges. And that's a big, big problem that we've had uh, in the past. And very often the perception um, of motivation on psychological work outcomes in research is neglected. Right? So we look at performance, but we don't look very often at um, the workers' uh, perception, especially not over time. So there's a huge gap for those of you looking for interesting study topics. Um, the workers' perspective in the crowd setting is under-researched compared to all the other settings, and uh, it's contextualized in a very raw and immature way so far. Which is good, right? Which means opportunities for, for good research. And we will look uh, explicitly on task design. So how is the task designed that the crowd workers work on? Because we know from um, the, the work psychology that the task design determines mainly um, the overall work perception. And this is nothing special to digital uh, work. This is true since we know the assembly line and the negative effects of too much Taylorism. Um, that that can have a negative effect on, uh, on satisfaction and all the other um, effects. And the other thing that makes task design very interesting is, and that is something that is quite new in the, in the crowd work environment, we now see more and more intermediaries apply different ways of automation and combine it with crowd work. So the first wave of crowd work um, platforms basically used standard technologies for decomposing and aggregating tasks. Now we see more advanced and more sophisticated machine learn type of setting, text mining based approaches. So what is the, the division of labor and the, um, and the management task behind that is also getting more and more out automated with different effects on the task design of the crowd worker itself. So this is a very interesting area as well. So for this study, what we try to address is how the perception of task characteristics and financial compensation jointly influence the professional well-being of crowd workers. Because I, you might recall, this is funded by the union, uh, the foundation of the union. What they care about are good working conditions for people, right? So the question is, what is the role of financial compensation for good working conditions and the nature of the tasks for good working conditions? And uh, for those of you not coming from Germany, you know that we, um, you might know that we have a minimum wage, which is, has been introduced not so long ago, which is still an issue in, in uh, public debate, whether that was a smart move to do or not. So it's a regulatory issue, right? And um, the argument back then was from the union side that uh, we need to control for a minimum level of income so that good work uh, principles on top of that make in the combination a decent life possible, right, out of your own work. And that's basically the same thing um, that, that we try, the same logic we try to follow here. Now, when we speak about crowd work, we have at least three structural characteristics that have to be uh, existent before um, looking at uh, anything else. First of all, financial compensation, right? So it has to be financially re uh, remunerated and it has to be a full-time, part-time, or whatever type of portion of, of employment. The other thing is, we believe that crowd work always requires autonomy of the person being in the crowd. So he or she chooses when to work, where to work, on what to work. So this is the core element to me of crowd, right? So the self-determination, the self-selection of the people working there. And what is also a necessary condition for us is IT facilitation which means that a large chunk of the value creation, a large chunk of the value creation has to be done on the platform. Because then we can apply all those mechanisms we know from platform work, right? Like the scalability and all those sort of things. So if you asked me, is Uber crowd work? No, it's not. Because the large part of the value creation is not done on the platform, right? It's just the matchmaking. It's just this small part of um, supply and demand matching. Whereas um, all the examples that we will look at, they have a large part of the work itself being done on the platform. So now coming to the conceptual background, the task characteristics. We know that the perception of task characteristics are key antecedents of satisfaction with work 
and identification with work. So the difference between satisfaction and identification is basically the duration they refer to. Satisfaction usually can be on a task-based level. Identification usually is with a work setting. Right? So I'm proud to be a researcher. That's my identification. Um, I'm satisfied with my data analysis. The last time I did it, this is much smaller um, uh, chunk um, of, of task um, that we will refer to. So what we're after is basically this long-term perspective, perspective on identification with work. We know that there are important contextual fact factors that influence these relations and um, we're drawing a lot in the literature on digital, uh, on, on computer mediated work. That's nothing new, that's been around since we have the late 90s. Um, telework was the first time this, this was coined and used in, 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 um, in uh, social sciences and in computer science and uh, we know that most of those constraints and limitations there uh, are also true for, for the more modern types of, um, of um, digital work. The other thing we know is that task de decomposition also affects the nature of work. We know that from the industrial revolution and the assembly line and that sort of things and we know the same also from the digital work environment. And we know that the task's characteristics also have a strong impact on intrinsic motivation that is grounded in performing a certain task. So these are things we know from, from literature and we use the self-determination theory, a rather mature theory coming from the work psychology environment and uh, the colleagues um, Decky and Ryan have been using it I think for 20 years, 25 years, replicating it and they have a huge present for us which is wonderfully tested scales. right? So for most of the things we look at, they have a huge repertoire of great scales. So no need to reinvent the wheel by developing new scales. And it's also nice because that way we can reference back these types of results to other settings where the um, instruments that go back to that theory um, have been used. And the most dominant one is um, the work design um, survey instrument which is also used by the European Union and which is also used by the OECD. So that's a, that's a good starting point, right? So in the self-determination uh, theory, it's about um, professional well-being. And this is affected by the individual's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And in the working context, that's the specific, we distinguish between controlled motivation and autonomous motivation. So the controlled one is that comes from um, the setting of the organization and the other one is the one that is inherited in us and we would see that we have conflicting results regarding financial compensation in crowd work. Why? Because on the one hand side it's an extrinsic motivation and on the other side it can also be a signal for appreciation, making you feel valuable and respected um, that you get that type of uh, compensation. The other thing we know and this concept we call internalization so that it'll become like an intrinsic motivation that way. The other thing that um, we look at are the task characteristics and how they match to the different motivation types. And we like to believe that these are considered to be additive. So they add to each other. So the overall uh, motivation is the sum of the, um, um, the, um, the different pieces. And uh, so why do we look at identification as the focal variable? And I'll just show the model with you in, in a second so that you can see where this all leads to. Um, well, as I, as I stated before, it's a higher level psychological work outcome. It's the long term focus. Uh, it's the pivotal antecedent to professional well-being, which is at the core of self-determination theory. And it has this long term orientation uh, and it's part of one's self-awareness. Right. So we can report on it. It is how we feel about it. So this is the model and we are assuming what we would call a moderated mediation effect. So on the left hand side we see the different task characteristics like the perceived autonomy, the perceived task variety, the perceived task ident identity and the perceived feedback as task characteristics by working on the task. And we know that from the theory that is um, an antecedent of um, satisfaction and that is an antecedent or a determinant of the identification with the crowd work. And uh, we assume that financial compensation will be um, 
the moderator for this mediation, right? Um, you would find many studies that try to connect this directly with this, right? And we will show that this model that way explains more variance. And you would also see that you would have financial compensation directly influence um, the perceived um, identification and satisfaction. Um, we controlled for all of that and I will share that with you in a couple of seconds. So our assumptions are we will see positive effect on satisfaction and identification. That's the core anchor here. We assume positive effects of the task characteristics on identification. And we assume that financial compensation moderates the indirect effect of task characteristics <coughs> on identification work through satisfaction. So this is a rather complex model, but you will see that it's worth the effort because variance we explain will go up significantly by, by playing it this way. So the data collection uh, is based on the biggest um, crowd work data collection that I'm aware of. Um, only German speaking and filtered only for um, German platforms, right? Because the web is very hard to measure by nation. The best thing we can do is language. Um, so the German speaking internet is the first, uh, the first setting. The second one is the platform where we collect the data. If they're all located in Germany. Um, so there, there might be a little bias, there might be some Swiss people working on, an, on uh, a German platform or some Austrians working on a German platform, but um, that's the best we can do um, to control for that. Uh, we see four different types of crowd working platforms, very, very typical ones. So it's uh, basically testing, innovation, click work, and uh, I forgot the fourth, but um, it's covering all major types of crowd work uh, platforms. So it's a cross-platform setting. That's the first thing, right? It's the first study, to the best of my knowledge, that does that across all platform types. And the demographics that we see um, is a typical um, digital nomad, digital worker type of setup, right? So average 35, uh, mainly single, not so male dominant, right? So a little bit skewed, but not that much. 66% um, employed or self-employed and um, higher education level than the average of the, edu uh, of the uh, population. So we have more people with um, A-levels or Abitur uh, than we would have in the population. Right? And uh, we see that um, we asked, of course, the crowd workers for their wages. Um, by average, 50% of them, of their total income, is achieved through crowd work, so they are heavy workers. right? And uh, the average um, salaries here are above minimum wage and the average income they generate is 534, right? So depending on where you are and what your social situation is in Germany, this can be substantial, right? If you think of someone being on social, on social security, 500 euros is a lot of money to them, right? So it's not just um, for fun. How do we operationalize the constructs? We use the work design questionnaire, as um, introduced before. Um, how do we measure financial compensation? We use the monthly average income from crowd workers over the last three months, so that we control a little bit for the seasonalities. And um, we relate it to the hours worked on platform. Now here comes the big, the big, the big, the big, the big methodological problem. Like with any study on um, not taxed income, right? We have to trust what people say. That's the best we have, right? So if you say you've worked that many hours, I have no way of controlling that, right? So that's the big, the big methodological problem. Um, the controls we use, the total income, the share of crowd work to total income, the employment status um, for your other job, right? Because this is usually the second or third job. Um, how active you are on the platform, gender, age, educational level, uh, and we have dummies for all platform types. That's the most important one so that we can see if there are significant differences between click work, testing and so on when it comes to the results on how they perceive the work. How do we do the construct validation? I mean, that is um, all uh, probably known to you who work with, um, with um, survey research. We do uh, exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis. We check for the convergent validity, the discriminant validi uh, validity, and the reliability of factors. If you're interested in those details, feel free to approach me in any given moment. 
Uh, yesterday we got uh, finally the acceptance letter of the paper, so I don't have to tweak anything no more. Now it's published. I'm more than happy to share all the details and all the data with you, um, so no problem. Um, what do we apply as an empirical strategy? We use ordinary least square with a non-parametric bootstrapping approach. Right? And uh, we use variation of causal step regression procedures while also ruling out alternative models. That was the one that they forced us over the process of the review. Right? Um, and that's where I had to learn it the hard way. That, that is a different thing. And um, the bootstrapping approach tested directly for the moderation mediation effect. That way we can rule that out now, which means now we're on the safe side um, to show that these uh, things are true. And uh, we have low um, type 1 errors and high power in assessing the moderate mediation effects and we have a higher predictive validity than causal steps uh, or the product of coefficients approach, so the Sobel test. So these are the regressions, if you feel like that is interesting to you. Uh, we test the direct effect of the independent variable on perceived identification, the direct effect on satisfaction, and on satisfaction as a mediator. It's all tested in all, in all variations. Now let's look at the uh, regression results. So we, see we, we calculate three different types of equation, assuming um, the different types of how you could um, explain what is happening. And uh, we see here um, the values for um, um, the tested effect of perceived autonomy as independent variable, task variety, task identity, and perceived feedback. And uh, the second one you would see um, on uh, perceived satisfaction with crowd work. This is perceived identification. You see the values go up here, right? And uh, in the third one you see um, that the uh, dependent variable on perceived identification with crowd work um, and it has almost no significance on the first ones, right? But we have perceived satisfaction with crowd work in the, on a mediator, rather strong and significant. No? The moderator, financial compensation, that's quite interesting, right? And the perceived feedback and um, financial compensation, and that leads basically um, to us then doing a bootstrap and the bootstrapping result for the moderate mediation effect where you basically distinguish the percentiles um, of the um, independent variable um, and the color coding gives you an indication about um, the overall pattern of the effects. And the mediation effects of perceived autonomy, perceived task variety and perceived feedback, they're all moderated by financial compensation. And that was our initial assumption, right? And the task variety, um, that's the only one that uh, is not moderated. Which is quite interesting for theorizing. So, let's go to the results. Um, basically, most of the hypotheses um, hold, except for the task variety and identification that is not moderated. So the first one that was satisfaction and identification is rock solid. Um, the satisfaction mediates um, the effect of perceived autonomy, task variety, task identity and feedback on identification and the mediated effect um, of is moderated by financial compensation across all those. Right? So basically the model holds true and we explain much more variance that way. That's the interesting one. We almost increase the variance by 40%. That is quite nice. Then robustness. Uh, they gave us a very hard time because this is survey research when it comes to common method variance and all those types of nasty things. For those of you who are not familiar with common method variance, that's a methodological problem that when you control, uh, that when you collect data from the same individual, um, for the independent and the dependent variable, there might be a flaw in it, right? So we've done all the tests that we could get hold of. Um, Potsakov and the Harman single factor tests, um, no indication whatsoever that we have, uh, that we might have a common method variance issue. Uh, we also used unmeasured latent marker construct technique to do that and also that gave no indication for common method variance. So it seems to be not an issue here. Uh, endogene endogeneity, oh, I love that word, 
Um, there are two potential sources of that, right? So a predictor's value is not given, but rather deliberately chosen based on the purposes of the crowd working platforms or the crowd workers with high levels of identification might have self-selected themselves to participate in our survey. Those could be the two sources for flaws, right? Uh, we do that, uh, we, we check for that uh, with a two-step regression approach. Uh, we estimate the effects of instrumental variables uh, on each independent variable and the sec second step is that we test the effect of the independent on the dependent variable while controlling for the residuals of the first steps of regressions. So that's the way how we try to rule that out. And uh, the data there is also um, highlighted in the tables here. So the complexity, specialization, interaction with platform, the cognitive demands and the equipment use are instrumental var variables that we use. I, I find it very hard to report that in a talk because it's very dense. Um, but uh, those details basically just give you the, the message that we tested for all possible uh, flaws that might be in the data, right? And um, bottom line is, um, all the data uh, results or the analysis results that we are getting gives us no indication whatsoever that there might be a flaw. And that is the good news, right? Um, the robustness of results when it comes to uh, the second source of endogeneity, the satisfaction with the crowd. Uh, so that again is task significance, problem solving, context fa factors and meaningfulness as instrumental variables and again um, that are values that make us believe that there is no issue whatsoever there. Next one would be propensity score matching. So the moderating effect of financial compensation could be only appropriately judged if crowd workers perform, performed the same task, which by definition is not true because we sampled across different platform types. So by definition, that might be an issue, right? So this is hardly fixable for us. This is something we have to acknowledge, right? And the second best approach to deal with this is um, an, a propensity score matching, where we divided the respondents into a high and a low financial compensation group. And we're using task characteristics um, to match each respondent in both groups against his or her closest counterfactual. So that's a way of how to try to control for the difference in the, in the tasks and to see whether their behavior changes in a certain way. Um, but uh, that also turned out to be um, quite, quite sound, right? So the matched sample consists of 286 responses and the results remain consistent. So that way we believe we can use the full data set. Yeah. If you have questions, any given moment, right? Now, what does that mean in results? Well, the first one is, and that's quite interesting for us from a theoretical perspective, we introduce a multi-platform view on crowd work, right? Remember that the challenge always was apple and oranges. This is a setup where we can control for those apple and oranges and see that the phenomenon of interest is stable. Um, we think that this is a nice work um, to show that specific type uh, of crowd uh, of crowd work and one specific type of platform studies cannot address, but what we can. And uh, we also think we can overcome selection biases because we're at least a little bit more generalizable, right? With all the constraints that I mentioned before. And what I find also very interesting, and we had that in the break, I think, uh, with uh, the colleague Schneider. Um, very often we get feedback if we have national data in international journals, well, that's a German data set. I think in this case it's an advantage because most of the studies that you would get from international contexts, a large percentage of the crowd workers are coming from third world countries, right? So Amazon Mechanical Turk is, is, is a good example where you have a huge proportion of Indian, Pakistani and so on. This is now one coming from the first world only, right? With a very specific setup where it's very clear that this is something that is happening in a highly developed country in good economic times. So that is definitely something that you can use to inform um, uh, decision making and, and discussions about how to regulate and how to deal those things, right? And uh, the other thing, the moderated mediation effect is a nice one because it extends the prior research on motivational factors, which looked at motivational factors isolated. But that's basically not getting it, 
it is the combination of things and their interaction that explains much more uh, variance. And it is the task designing crowd work um, that we can now address when we look at the psychological outcome of it. We see the interaction of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and they jointly shape the satisfaction and identification. And that's the interesting part to me. And the satisfaction reflects the generative mechanism through which the task characteristics and financial moderation facilitate identification. So it's a different logic that we see. What is that helping us um, for understanding the financial compensation? Well, first of all, the financial, satisfaction, uh, financial compensation does not affect satisfaction, contrary to prior research, right? And the satisfaction is a short-term evaluation of work outcome, um, and, and the financial compensation does directly and indirectly affect the identification with the crowd work. So it's the repeated positive short-term evaluations that the identification measures. And um, we see that this is very much in line with uh, what the unions had advocated for. Once you get to a certain level, let's call it minimum wage, that's the necessary precondition to have decent work conditions on top of that. If you don't have the necessary uh, income level achieved, you can have the greatest work design, it'll not be effective when it comes to satisfaction and identification with the task because the prerequisites are not there. Um, an alternative interpretation of the effects of increasing compensation, so once we get over the plateau effect, is that salaries or uh, income can also be perceived as informational cues, and it's that way an internalized extrinsic motivation. So the fact that you make more money on that task compared to others is also a social mes message, right, which gives you self-esteem in that type of um, activities. And the indication of appreciation and competence that crowd workers have built up uh, on crowd working platforms is something, I don't know if you came across that, in most crowd work platforms, your most intangible, most relevant intangible asset you have as a crowd worker is your profile. Because it documents your skills, your expertise, your routine. And for instance, in software testing, that determines 90% of the type of jobs you get exposed to. So it has value to you. So having that, um, that profile um, is your precondition for getting the better paid jobs. And if you were to change the platform, for instance, you would start in a new system with, a, with an empty profile and you would have to build your profile from scratch again. Right? And um, you can see that for those who stay in platforms, um, that type of profile is something that they actually use and signal right? to showing their expertise also to peers. So that is an interesting element um, that uh, most platforms actually don't use it wisely enough, right? So they don't always have these different levels of expertise um, showing it to the other crowd workers so that they can use it as a social comparison or a social um, currency. Um, the other thing that when it comes to theorizing is about task decomposition. We use it as a contextual element that affects the design and the perception of crowd work. And we see that higher levels of task identity lead to higher satisfaction. So the more identity you're given to the tasks, um, the higher the satisfaction. And it turns over time into identification, which means lower degrees of task and composition lead to higher satisfaction. So this is basically where you see, especially in the click work setting, when things are being pushed too far so that there's no way of how to um, have um, um, your levels of task identity that you would need to be satisfied with it. Um, from an economic point of view or from a management point of view, we would advise those companies to give more degrees of freedom into the task to improve work outcomes and uh, also the satisfaction with the type of work setting. Um, so these overly decomposed tasks may hinder um, positive outcomes. And actually that's something that we also see from studies on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, so that's also might maybe true across cultures. Right? And um, we also see um, the mechanism uh, being contingent on level of financial compensation. So task identity only has an effect on identification once we have a certain level. So again this minimum wage argument kicks in. This becomes relevant the moment people say okay that's enough so that I can live on it or whatever it is that I perceive as the threshold.
Right? There are a lot of practical implications you can derive from, uh, derive from that study. Uh, governance mechanisms that encourage crowdsourcers to create tasks that allow for autonomy, variety and identity and also to give um, feedback. They would directly influence um, the satisfaction identification. So giving crowd workers the, ch the chance to give feedback and to share with other crowd workers we can measure has positive effects. Uh, we see that uh, over Taylorism uh, approaches are negative, right? Um, also for um, the click work areas. And we also see that, especially if you run the click work on cent levels, I mean, that is again a catalyst for even worse um, satisfaction identification levels. I, I find that very intuitive. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we see that those who do it well, um, those crowd workers develop a strong psychological bond. We found it in our case studies that we've done on software testing, um, very strong um, uh, bond to what they call their community. Right? So this is also where sometimes the terms literature get a little bit blurry. Um, so um, for instance with, um, with Testbirds, one of the big German crowd testing um, uh, providers, um, they call their crowd workers their birdies. And um, so um, they have the bird manager, which is the community manager, and they would never use the word crowd, right? Never, never, for multiple reasons, right? Because it's attributed negatively, uh, because it's not how they feel about it, because the definition of community is a sense of belonging together. That's what they want to create. They want the crowd workers to feel that they belong there. So this is where maybe also some of the theories that you read that are being used around crowd work could better be uh, replaced by uh, theories we know from online communities in that field. Um, the other thing is we see churn rates um, of crowd workers. And churn rates of crowd workers are very much in line with our results. A direct function of how good do you implement good working conditions. Right? So the click work has a huge churn, whereas the software testing has almost no churn. This gives you a strong indication if you want to do that in a sustainable way, well, you need to design reasonable working and payment structures so that people stay there for longer. And, um, but the, uh, the other thing is, how do you get the new labor upskilled and into the system? And that's where those mechanistic tasks still have legitimacy, so that people have this fast uh, return on having done something successful. Right? So it's probably also something where you have to control and account for the life cycle of the crowd workers. All right, further practical implications, crowd worker exchanges. Um, yeah, I think those, those effects are quite, quite um, straightforward. And uh, the, um, the deteriorating strength of marginal effects of additional payment, that's of course the, the relevant one. So the one you want to identify, where is the, the minimum wage level that you need for your community and our data shows it's different, right? So for software testing it's higher than it would be for click work. Once you have that sweet spot there is not much need to go beyond that, right? You rather need to do other things to keep the crowd engaged. And uh, yeah, so what we would love to do and what we're currently trying to do is a follow-up studies. Um, we wanted to convert this one-time study into a panel study. Um, so far we have three more measurements, um, but our sample size is shrinking, right? So now we're at 180 that have four measurements, which is still nice, but uh, borderline for some of the stats we've done. So that might be the next study to see if there is a dynamic overtime in it. And um, there are a lot of things um, to, to examine here, uh, interrelations between work performance, psychological work outcomes and so on. So for those of you interested in that type of empirical uh, work on digital, on digital work, um, a plethora of open things, right? So, and since there is a DFG group here, I think uh, there are hundreds of opportunities to do reasonable studies and, and interesting stuff, which if interpreted well, can help us make better decisions on how we want to build a good future for digital work. Because that's at the end of the day what we should do, right? Because if we don't do it, um, it'll not happen. It'll not happen. That's something we can see um, already, just looking at the US data. So, my takeaways, satisfaction mediates the effects uh, of task characteristics on identification. The effects are stronger 
um, once we have um, a greater financial compensation and there are psychological limits to task decomposition in crowd work. That's it. Thank you very much. And that, at the end of the day, brave you. Uh, thank you very much for the very informative talk. Um, as far as I understood, you have created the data set, so, and then you published this task to the crowd. How did you identify uh, which features do you have to cover in the data set, and how did you so uh, the, you know, the data should have the features in order to reflect the information that you want to have as outcome, right? How did you uh, identify the features? How many features did you have? And how did you um, distribute these features among the data that you had? That would be very interesting to me. So what we've done is we've collected data on using the, um, the uh, work design questionnaire um, that full fledge requires some 40 minutes to fill out. Extended it so that it's in one hour um, survey to fill out and posted that survey across 86 Germans, mainly German speaking crowd work platforms, that has, uh, which means we have a vast variety of data in there. And um, so from that, we then isolate the things that we believe are relevant. So the features that you refer to uh, are mainly coming from the case studies we've done with different, different types of um, platforms. So we've run now, I think, 10 to 15 platforms, uh, case studies on each type of platform. And from that, basically, the PhD students then came up with their conceptualization. So the features came from the previous studies? Yes. That how to, uh, what should be the questions in the questionnaire in that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I can only, I can only um, share with you my, f my uh, usage experience with a work design questionnaire. It covers a lot. It covers a lot. Really covers a lot. So that will be my follow-up question. Um, what is your experience with the work design questionnaire and what other dimensions of the work design, design questionnaire actually work well with crowd design uh, work? Because what we found in our research is that not all the dimensions fit on crowd work now that you have this small task level. True, true. So there are a couple of extensions um, on the work design questionnaire that go for more granular type of work. I don't know if you're familiar with that literature, that's because that's a phenomenon of the digital times, right? So the granularity gets lower. Um, we, we used the latest version and the extensions um, that helped us. Uh, and we also had, um, uh, yeah, uh, batteries and scales that were just not applicable. That's, that's because of the nature of work, right? So everything that is about the physical elements doesn't make sense in a digital environment, right? Assuming that people don't do physical work, so why would you, would you control for that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have another question, if I'm still on turn. Um, rather in the beginning of your talk, you, you spoke that the task that you find on code work platforms are actually evolving now that you have data mining or um, algorithm or learning me mechanisms. Um, do you see that the tasks themselves and content or that the role the crowd worker plays on the, on the crowd work tasks are changing too? And does this also um, change task characteristics and yes. the way your model works? Yes. Yes? In Three what times way? Yes. <laughs> Three times yes. We see that um, the task of, um, of the um, crowd manager is changing substantially. Um, and now there are big differences in the type of crowd work, right? So let's use the, the easiest case, that's the software testing, mm -hmm. where you can see how the job of the test manager uh, has so much potential by automation to be more efficient, to produce his test cases faster, um, to cut the chunks um, that he hands out to the crowd in different ways. Mm -hmm. And now we see also algorithms that try to do um, combinations of test cases so that you reduce the error. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the version one would be you give 
twice the same task to two different people. If it matches, you're good. If it's different, um, you give another task out to check for it. That's a very simplistic way. The more modern um, algorithms, they would cut the cases differently. Mm -hmm. So that way you would have more cross-checkings and more, more options to test whether what's coming back um, qualifies as a bug or not. And um, they see quality increases that are substantial because of that. So it's not so much what the crowd worker in testing is doing, it's the way how you design the task that, that allows higher quality. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, of course, higher productivity levels. So uh, for instance, the test birds have been reporting on substantial increase there. And uh, um, uh, a Swiss company that is uh, specialized in that field uh, was talking about productivity increases of 50% over one year just by changing the way how you design and allocate the tasks. And to me, this is like a, a, a moment in time where everyone is trying what works, right? So you see a competition of concepts there. And uh, so far, there is no dominant pattern what is, what, is, uh, what is winning. What definitely is promising is everything with text mining, mm -hmm. because they, the, this is the, the, the 2080 rule, right? Uh, with 20% of the effort, you can cover for 80% of the work just by pre-automating it. And in many tasks, that, that feedback comes in text, uh, and that is very powerful. So it's not so much um, something that the crowd worker, the individual crowd worker experiences, but something that's um, optimizing the process in the background? That was the examples that I gave you. Now, in the, um, in the, in the text mining, um, you would see that you ask different things mm -hmm. people to do. Right? So also the variance of tasks goes up because the algorithm is doing more advanced and different things. So that is an example where um, the autonomy and, and uh, the task identity could be influenced in a positive way. So this is also nice because it shows us that sometimes technology can make work better mm -hmm. by making it less routine and less standardized. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I just wondered, because I'm um, currently doing research on this uh, topic too, on autonomy, for example, uh, and using the self-determination theory, if you also include the counterpart monitoring in another study, for example, because I wondered how um, crowd workers are monitored and how this could probably affect their satisfaction or, or identification. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have not controlled for that in that study. Um, but this is something that I'm 100% convinced of being highly relevant for internal crowd work. If you apply the same logic I within an organization, that's what we're currently studying and working on, um, this negative thing of being controlled and monitored is much more relevant to what determines, am I happy with that type of work? So we're currently working with a big tier one supplier in the car industry um, that is launching that in pilots across his R&D departments. And the logic goes like this. Um, for 20% uh, of your time, so the fifth day of the week, um, you are free to work uh, on projects that you wish. And here is the infrastructure, the platform where you can choose them if you wish. And uh, there the question of control and accountability uh, is, is definitely very relevant um, to measure to see whether um, identification and that type of things are influenced in a positive or negative way. Because there's also a lot of dependence on the company culture and let's say the, the, the previous history of how management and employees have interacted, whether that is a trustful environment or whether there's more control elements in it. So there we can see it already in the case studies that it's relevant. Um. I would also have a question. I have a microphone, so I <laughs> don't need to take the other one. Uh, yes. Uh, so um, my my question would be: What you're saying is that uh, we actually should also pay crowd workers more, right? I think in a normative sense that might also make sense in a certain way. But I'm thinking, is that not also wishful thinking in a certain way, right? I mean, being an economist, I would say, well, there's supply and demand, right? We determine the price, and if the price is very low, bad luck, right? Now, if we artificially increase the price, I mean, that would be kind of, let's imagine you have three postdocs, right? One you can finance, the second one you can't, and the third one you can't either. But you could pay for a research assistant, right? 
And then the guy does it, you know, like he's working, uh, you know, for the research assistant wage. And uh, then what you're saying is if you increase it to a minimum wage, well, this guy would have not been in academia in the first place, right? And now we ask actually whoever it is, the taxpayer, the platform, whoever, to pay the full wage for him or for her. And, uh, but doesn't that in some ways skew the market, right? I mean, now everyone gets in, everyone who wants to do it, I mean, they're getting bad pay, uh, but we're giving the good pay because we think it's actually the thing we should do, right? Mm -hmm. So y your assumption is that my, my reasoning is uh, pay them more. That's not correct. My assumption is if you are run a platform, you need to know, do I want my crowd workers to be around with me for a long time? That's my precondition. In testing, that's very important because the type of jobs that I get requires experienced crowd workers much more than unexperienced. You usually have excess um, supply of unexperienced, but what you need are the experts. Uh, and if you want to keep experts, you need to keep them happy. In order to do so, that's basically what's coming out of the data, pay them in a, in a reasonable way um, so that the other characteristics of the task, for instance, that it's more fun to work with you, that it's more interesting to do the things, that they can choose more things, they become more relevant once you go beyond that level. That's the implication, right? If you are in the, in the Amazon Mechanical Turk model, there's no need. Right, but does it mean that the testing platforms, uh, for instance, don't get it? Like there's a market failure that they're no, paying too no, little, no, no, but no. they no, pay no. the decent wage. So there's no need for regulation for that. Then. I'm not arguing for regulation either. Um, not not on with the data that we have right now. There is no uh, evidence whatsoever in all our studies of abuse of power or of market failure. That, let's be very clear here, right? That's nothing we see in our data. But we see superior results and better performance for those who treat their crowd workers better. That's basically a very straightforward economic argument. Uh, you have happy employees, they do better jobs. So, right? so that's basically the logic. And it's a calibration thing. And you'd be surprised to see how many platforms actually have not thought well about where to set, let's say, the, the entry level for the compensation. That way they give away potential, right? But if you, if you check for that, what is the best way how to get into that entry level, or how you build careers within the crowd so that they get quickly to that level, you would attract more of the, of the scarce crowd workers that you want to have. And, that's, and you can see that those who are successful, they're better at that than the others. So that's the um, uh, evidence we get from the case studies that uh, what we see here in the large scale data set um, is, is also happening in the in the in-depth case studies. But we should discuss market failure once we see economic downturns. I'm very sure that the ability of the market to absorb twice the amount of crowd workers is not there. And then we will see market failure. But that's my personal guessing now. Which is of course also logic um, which is reflecting the ancient Fordism. Eh? If you want to keep good workers among you as an employer, you have to invest into them, and which of course works when they have some skills. And, and the, the less skills they have, the more weak, and, and the less uh, from an employer side or a platform side you want to invest in, into them. And then comes in, pops in the question, do you have to uh, correct? At, at one question, or well, it's a, a question or remark, it's, it's, it was on work, uh, the definition of work, uh, which was the, an element of accomplishing a task, income. Yeah, so. But traditionally, in, in most of the social laws, there is a third element, which is regularity. It should have a regular pattern. So one activity with income is not work, but when that income is with some regular pattern, because then the idea is that you try to earn income uh, to live your life upon, eh, to, to, to earn your living. And here, they, uh, most of the systems, they, they, they struggle. How to measure that regularity? Is that regular? I was just about to say that. Yeah. So what do most well, what do some systems do in Europe? They say we we uh, do it differently. We look at a minimum amount of income you earn from that activity, and if that minimum is reached, uh, let's say 500 euros a month or 600 euros a month or, or 6,000 euros a year or dollars or whatever, then we consider that to be regular. So the amount you make yeah. would control for regularity. Yeah. yeah. And what do you do with those that are highly professionalized in, in testing, for instance, that do two hours, three well, hours that's, a month? That's, my, that's one of my points. But what I see that systems, at least social protection systems, more and more start to lay upon that kind of approach. Uh, in, in more and more countries, they say we give it up 
to find what is the regularity, we simply look at the income you generate. And if you generate enough income, we consider that activity to be work. Now, most of the time, it's around 6,000 euros a year or, or, or 600 months uh, a month. So if I saw the averages already in Germany, they, they, uh, they, they drop out, I mean, most of them. There is also a second line of reflection, they say, and that's also confirming the German, well, at least this sample. If you already have an activity, what's the sense of uh, bringing that second activity on a platform into the systems of pensions and so on? Uh, let us exempt that, I mean, because they're already protected. Oh. Which is, of course, creating false competition. Um, uh, but that, that's the direction in which mo well, there is a kind of tendency where you see that countries go into its uh, minimum thresholds, and um, if it's a side activity, let's exempt as well, which I think is, is it should be the, the other way around. You should broaden your income source as much as possible and so on and so forth. And when I listen carefully to your story, also for the, the element of satisfaction, it could be an additional element in, um, well, my kind of activity is also making sure that I can have supplementary pension, whatever, or supplementary and so on. Well, I might be biased by the, by the Swiss system, and in the Swiss system, we don't distinguish between the sources of income. Uh, we pay social security and everything. Which I think is the way to go for. Okay, so we have one more a question and then we have to head towards the, the conference dinner. Okay, and I'll I will try tell you to where it is after the, the question is answered. I'll try to keep it short. Okay, thank you very much. I have a brief theoretical question because we've been doing some research on digital transformation of organizations and we find one key challenge is um, identity, professional identity of employees. So, um, for example, how do I make sense of what I do here and what I am relative to IoT or something like that? And because you've been talking about identification as well, and you briefly touched on identity issues, like I'm a crowd worker, I'm asking, based on the case studies you've done, what type of identity dynamics have you seen or are, are they relevant at all sort of? in the sense that does the nature of crowd work affect what people consider themselves to be and what, what they do and stuff like that? So what we have not looked into is this, the identity perception of the individual overall, because we see people mainly being in multiple employments. What we've checked for is basically their identity perception once being part of the crowd. So. Uh, the example of, of the test birds is a good one, uh, where they have very strong bonds and they consider themselves to be a birdie, a test birdie, right? So the very active ones, they call themselves test birdies. And that's something, would this individual say, if you ask him in the morning, what are you, I'm a test birdie? I don't think so. Um, but it's, it's, it's a different, it's, it's an element of, and the, the previous studies we've done that we're looking for, is this something like an identity of a crowd worker? No, 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 no. Why? Because the, the type of work is so different and usually your object you refer to is the community or slash crowd you work for, not the type of work, right? So it would be like I'm a, I'm a Daimler person rather than I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a mechanic, right? So my professional understanding would be I'm with Daimler rather than I'm a mechanic. The same we would see here. 